Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I have a very special guest with me. I am so excited to speak to him. His name is Stuart Watkins, an absolute yogi guru, teacher, holistic life coach, health and wellness expert. Stuart runs workshops, events and retreats all over the world and he is the founder of Flow Festival in WA and Flow from the Heart charity events. Stuart has just released his first published and most beautiful book called Being Yoga. I have been dying to chat to this man for a while now as I follow him on Instagram and I just adore his values, his insights and his wisdom. It's just impeccable. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you for joining me today, Stuart. Thank you, Annie. Good to be joining you. Yes, lovely. Now, yeah. I, I'd like to start to ask my guests a, an easy question, which is, what does your morning routine look like? And is there something that's just absolute habit now? It's pretty spontaneous now, uh, especially with the new baby in our lives. So um, very spontaneous. I mean, I do have a few staple morning routines that I ideally like to do, and most of the time I do it, such as um, – Oil pulling, mm. one of the first things I do upon rising is oil pulling, normally with sesame seed oil or coconut oil, but normally sesame seed oil. And then uh, tongue scraping, and, um, and then I like to alkalize, so that might be with lemon water or apple cider vinegar, and just get hydrated. That, that's a real staple, that I must, no matter how busy or distracted I am, hydrated, but most of the time, even if I've got little Lani, my baby, in my arms, I'll be doing that while oil pulling a lot of the time. And I find that really helpful in just starting off fresh and clearing out any congestion. So they're, they're my two morning staples, hydration, alkalizing, and something to, to clear out any congestion from the sleep, hopefully, if I've slept. I love it. <laughs> yes, we miss those. Uh, we miss the whole thing of sleep when we've got new little ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so that's awesome. That's just you're you're calling to my Ayurveda cart, and that's key. And so, but um, moving on to my next question, which is. Yeah. Us Westerners don't usually, we're not usually brought up into this, into the yoga and the Ayurveda world. So how did you find yourself finding mm. yoga and what was that journey like for you? Sure. Um, I was personal training and I was deep in the fitness industry and I was just finding myself, there's a lot of birds out here right now, can you hear them? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was finding even though I was uh, treating myself well and was eating healthy and thought I was doing healthy things, I kept burning out. So that got me curious about something, meditation or yoga. I was just, I started getting curious. And um, then just the curiosity led me to entering a yoga class and it felt great. I hadn't felt that relaxed and that connected ever really mm -hmm. and that just opened up the seeking straight away going to more and more classes seeking out more and more teachers just started reading on yoga and ayurveda and just all kinds of different healing mod modalities um so it was really a, an avenue to heal my chronic fatigue that just kept coming up again and again and again and so what was like life like for you growing up? You grew up in Perth? I did, yeah. So was there quite a, was there quite a, um, a difference from how you were raised to how you're living now? Oh, for sure, without a doubt. Um, <laughs> I was brought up, I mean, I had a great upbringing, very active, uh, played many, many different sports and surfed and skateboarded. I cherished my upbringing. But it wasn't really around health and wellness. We were active, and luckily that's what kept a kind of foundation of some kind of wellness. But we did not eat good at all, at all. So um, I remember very distinctly when I got to, like, age 15, I, like, really didn't want to be unhealthy. Like, I saw certain people in 
um, in my family that I, that I just, I didn't want to end up like <laughs> uh, overweight and just uh, negative and just certain people in my family. I was like, holy crap, like, that better not be in my genealogy. <laughs> so I, um, I really got inspired from that of like, okay, they're not teaching me how to eat healthy, so I better learn how to. So um, at, at, at that particular stage, I actually got really unhealthy. I was partying a lot and just not being healthy, but that was a blessing in disguise. I kind of got really unhealthy, which then motivated me to get really healthy. So I started reading upon nutrition, and that's where the whole personal training thing started to begin. And um, it just took over my life. I just, it, probably too much at that point, I became kind of paranoid about unhealthy food and a bit too uptight about healthy stuff, mm. if that makes sense. Um, so it was a bit excessive at that point. And I was a bit judgmental on people that weren't healthy. And that was just the kind of entry level of finding some kind of uh, discipline in my life. But I think it took a while for it to balance out a bit. It, it, it was pretty excessive at that point. <laughs> That's yeah. I love that. I love that um, being able to to acknowledge that though. That's so yeah. beautiful and humble. And I think right. we all need to. It's such a journey, and so we always yeah. kind of go to the extremes to kind of balance out. But totally. um, I know for a lot of us that when we become awakened you know this enlightenment this kind all this this shift in perspective mm. it there's it's i know for me personally i can it's it was a time i can really remember the time and the the the, the space that almost the when it when it exactly happened was there a time like that for you or was it more gradual or um it feels like there's been a few different like peaks of that so um that time I was speaking of when I was really unhealthy as a teenager, I was partying a lot and unfortunately doing a lot of drugs at, at an age that I just shouldn't have been. And that was actually, it ended up being an awakening experience. I was really, I mean, for one, there were some really beautiful like psychedelic experiences that during that time that was very awakening in an unhealthy way, but it was opening the veil. And, um, and then that kind of peaked in its unhealthiness where I had a kind of near overdose uh, at 15 and that was part of the, the, the awakening and the kick in the ass to like get healthy and be mindful. And But that kind of feeling of thinking I was nearly going to die, which that's what it felt like, um, was a huge awakening. So that was like the first time I can recollect like, whoa like peeling beyond the veil and um but then that took a while to integrate there was the whole chapter of just gaining some kind of discipline and autonomy and then there was a next movement of an awakening uh a few years after that like 21 i remember being taking my first trip to bali and um that that was also meant to be a party trip we organized with about 20 something people to go over and just have a big party trip and I was kind of over partying by then to be honest I really <laughs> trying to be yeah, well, you must have gone hard <laughs> I, pe I peaked early huh? oh, love it. <laughs> so uh, we went on this supposed party trip but I was just blown away at the beauty of the Balinese people and their and their daily offerings of incense and and their, their just their tranquility and I just, I didn't want to party. I just wanted to be around these beautiful Balinese people and soak up what they were doing. I had no idea. But I was in Kuta and, you know, the whole Kuta, just craziness. It was just drunk Aussies everywhere. And I was just kind of repulsed by that, yet wanting to be around this deep spiritual aliveness. And that, that was a huge trip. That was a huge trip that... In retrospect, I can I can look back on it being very awakening, and then I came back to Perth and was really um, depressed and like judgmental at our our ways of being 
Mm-hmm. So again, it was like this integration that took took a while. And then I kind of kept escaping to that, trips to India, trips to Bali, trips to be in that bar, to be in that sacredness. Mm-hmm. And that I think that helped deepen a connection to that wakefulness. And then um, coming back again and again. And so each of those trips felt like a deeper awakening and then integration, uh, which I lay a lot of importance on for sure. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that kind of follows into my next question because you've got this beautiful video um, featured on your website where you talk about the difference and in, in integrating the ego self with mm-hmm. the spiritual self. And I'm just fascinated about this because it, mm. it's so important and I'm just so excited you talk about it, about there being a balance, you know, because in Ayurveda we talk about the mundane world and the ethereal world, which is exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about. So can you expand a bit about what you mean by that? Right. So... Um... As we're well aware of in our culture, most of our attention goes on ego and kind of only ego. And then often there's a, a flip of that when maybe one's had their initial awakening or they start to get curious about ex- aspects of the self beyond the small self, beyond the ego. And quite often an unhealthy flip to transcendence to just transcending ego just transcending body and because it's beautiful it is beautiful to get in touch with our true nature beyond the ego it's it's exquisite nothing quite compares to it but even that can become a trap of uh, being hooked on the formless being hooked on aspects of ourself beyond our ego but I, i kept finding in that attempt to push away the ego and push away distractions and push away stress in order to sit in the divine was adding even more suffering to my experience. And that's after observing more and more people around me, that's a pretty common experience Mm. to escape, to try to escape samsara, to try to escape form, to try to escape the ego and run up to the hills or run over to India or run and, And it just adds more suffering. So integrating ego with soul, with pure awareness, really is a functional and healthy way to be present with like anything. So yeah, it's beautiful to just sit by ourselves in meditation where it's so simple and beautiful. That's a good part of, I think, a practice, a healthy yoga practice or any kind of mindfulness practice. But then... Okay, here we are with our ego, our separate self. What the hell is it all about? Why are we in it? Like, there's no getting away from it. No matter how much I try to push it away, it's here. Like, there is a a relative truth to, yeah, we're separate. And here we are. And we're separate. But getting more and more in touch with pure awareness brings in wisdom, brings in clarity, brings in a fresh perspective, a deeper connection of what's real. So integrating ego with soul, with pure awareness, feels like yoga. It feels like balance of multiple dimensions of being in which we can be separate at the same time we're one. And there can be both. And I mean, our mind hates that. Our mind can't comprehend that. It'll try, it can like read books and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. But it doesn't really uh, compute fully until we, I think, ripen it in our own experience and our own practice, which I think that's what takes time. Like anyone can have an experience of the moment and an experience of self, capital S, beyond our ego. And anyone can. But to bring that into back into ego and back into form, I think that takes a real disciplined practice and like consistency and revisiting like daily because it's tricky. It's so the ego is very convincing. So um, 
that's that's my take on integrating these apparently separate dimensions that aren't separate at all. <laughs> mm, totally, yeah. And and you're right. It's all about um, getting present. I think because when we are in this space, in this space alone, then our ego do- cannot kind of go nuts unless we really sink into this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it, it, even talking about it, it can't even be talked about. That's, yeah. that's the predicament. As soon as we put words to it, the mind tries to get it. The mind tries to fit it into what it already knows. And that's the predicament. It can't be quite read in words. It can't quite be talked about. We can kind of point to it, mm. but that that's the common agony of it is that true balance of who we truly are. Um, it can only be. We can only be it. So, <laughs> so it can be quite challenging to even talk talk about it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> now, you've spent some time with Ram Das. Is that correct? And I, yeah. th- that's amazing. How, so how did that come about? Sure. Um, so um, years ago, when I was just getting curious about uh, sadhana, curious about yoga practice, curious about uh, the awakenings I was having, I just started getting in touch with his teachings, just started getting his audio books and his, all of his books. Uh, the, the original uh, Be Here Now was the first, which... I could really relate to, I could relate to his past with drugs. I could relate to his past with just ego trips and then the seeking of of true spirituality. And I I could just really relate. And that opened up a kind of obsession with him. I just, pretty much every moment I could, I would be listening to his lectures or reading his books and then um, just started reaching out to him and we would have Skype sessions like this and just talk and, and, um, and connect. And then started going on retreats with him uh, whenever I could. And then he married Joe and I. And it's just been a deepening uh, relationship. And we get to Maui whenever we can. That's like home away from home where he lives. And luckily we... we just get to hang out with him and and soak up that beautiful energy and and just uh, be around that bar of that beautiful energy. Mm. So yeah, that's how it's come about. And what, what do you think is the biggest thing that you've taken away from his teachings? I mean, his primary teaching that Neem Kuroli Baba like gave to him was love everyone and tell the truth. (sighs) So, I mean, that, and he admits that he is still growing into that teaching. He was given that teaching back in the 70s, yet he is still growing into that teaching. <laughs> so um, he really feels like a living statement of that, of just loving awareness. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's been really key in helping me uncover that, that depth of true love, like, abiding love that isn't confined to uh, just the romantic image of love, but a deeper actual love. And just to see a being be in that space for not just a couple years or a few years, but decades and decades and decades, it, it's just inspiring. It's, it's endlessly inspiring. So it's the exquisite nature of how he has taught at the same time it's beyond all of his books and words and just the way he is which is pure love Mm. Mm. that's amazing that's so amazing so one of my final questions now you're a dad of two beautiful little girls which i've seen on your instagram um and i know for myself for being a parent of a little girl as well that it can be quite hard to practice this whole be here now thing when you're in the action of doing all the time mm-hmm. <laughs> and say yeah. you're, your toddler's having a tantrum, screaming tantrum and you, you know, it's just, it's, it's crazy every day. Yeah. So how do you, how do you integrate what you practice, what you, mm-hmm. you know, 
that's kind of practice what you preach thing. How do you mm-hmm. integrate those two worlds? Yeah. Um, it just becomes an extension of the practice. So, uh, I mean, for one, I feel the baby is like a clear mirror of where mm. I am at. I can feel it all the time. Mm. And again, the mind will go nuts, just them having a tantrum. But pretty much every time there's a reflection of my state as well. And I can feel when I shift gears and when I center and when I connect with just pure love, they quieten down or they might not quieten down, but it won't be so overwhelming. So it's just a practice of, uh, I mean, the breath is so helpful because just trying to be here now while there's a screaming baby, just trying, 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 trying (laughs) doesn't do it. (laughs) So it's like, it's like, all right, this is just crazy. Like, and being honest with the irritability that comes up. Like, yes, that's okay. I love you know? that. So like, okay, fuck, I'm like just irritable and like I just, it'd be so much easier if they just shut up and I could just sit down and meditate. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. And so just like following the breath, okay, irritability, here's irritability, here's restlessness, here's tiredness, here's all this stuff. And then just offering it into the breath again and again, offering it into the breath. And it's such a beautiful practice. It's so intense. It's one of the most intense practices Mm. I've come across. But uh, it's so beautiful because they're a direct reflection. So as I shift gears and not be so reactive and as I shift into my heart and just hold space for them to be a baby, they just melt. And then I just melt. And then they melt even more. And then I just melt and... And so it's tricky. And I'll admit, I'm not always on my game. Sometimes I'll get all irritable and I'll get sucked into the irritability and I'll just be reactive and grumpy, for sure. Especially if I'm tired and I'm not feeling great. Yeah. And just got to be honest with that and let it, let it flow. But I do feel the yoga practice has extended into life in which um, – Often we'll put like a mantra on. Uh, I've done a few posts on it lately. We've got like a, a go-to mantra by Guru Singh. It's um, Ha Ha Hari, which is one of the names for God. And it's just on repeat, on repeat. It's like a 20-something minute long mantra. And we did it for Soleil as well when she was really young. And every time we put that on, she would melt, wow. no matter how irritable. Yeah. And... Um, we're doing the same thing with, with Lani as well as if she's having trouble falling to sleep or just irritable, we'll put that on and she'll melt. It's a powerful song. So we'll do that and we'll be just mucking around and chanting to it. And, um, it's just become a part of our life. And again, it doesn't always work, but most of the time it does. I've got another thing where I'll just lay uh, Lani on my lap and like, we'll be listening to like that mantra most of the time. It's on like repeat. And I'll be like tapping on her back while I'm breathing deep and, um, and just make it a part of the practice. Another thing I do is play the didgeridoo, Mm -hmm. which um, that actually came about when Soleil was a baby. I had a didgeridoo sitting there and I hadn't, I picked it up a couple of times, but I hadn't quite learned to play it properly yet. But, uh, Often when she was irritable, I would pick it up and play it. And I was like, wow, like she would drop into deep relaxation or she'd stop crying when she heard the didgeridoo. And I found that was feeding my practice as well, like pranayama, breath work, and just getting vibrations flowing. So uh, all of a sudden I've got all these like drone instruments around, like didgeridoos and singing bowls and all that. (laughs) Because uh, I find it helps them Symphony, and it also it. helps me. Yeah. So um, just creating these beautiful vibrations helps mm. for sure. Because mm. um, just trying, trying to quiet them, trying to get them quiet, trying to get them quiet is very similar to us trying to be present, trying to be present, trying Usually. to be like, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so it's, it's like it's controlling mentality, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So just kind of 
slowing down, taking a breath and relax into the moment and, and do something that's going to help elevate the energy. And they're, they're my tools for bringing in uh, some yoga practices while holding the baby. Another thing I do is I just strap, strap Lani on and, um, and it's one of the most beautiful practices. Like she'll drop into a deep sleep and I'll feel her heartbeat while I do my breath work. And it's beautiful. It's so much better than just doing it by myself. So much better. Feeling this pure little heartbeat. I mean, it's Incredible. great. So um, I think it just takes a bit of adaptability and getting over our selfishness and, <laughs> and like needing our own space. And it, it took me a while because before having Soleil, I mean, I had quite a few years of very much a renunciate path of just being by myself and then then teaching and then being by myself and then teaching. And it was a very simple life. So there was def- it took me a while to shift gears into a householder life, but then it's so much better. It's so much better than um, uh, anything else, but uh, it's all good. Whatever, yeah, whatever yeah. comes out. I completely out. agree. I completely <laughs> agree. And I just think, yeah, it, it's a whole new, it's a whole new paradigm being a yeah. parent, a whole new. So yeah. <laughs> you really yeah. cannot explain it unless you're in it. It's just like yeah. you're saying, you can't experience the now. You can't tell it. You have to feel it. That's and right. experience. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> to wrap things up, now, now you're heading off to LA soon, are you? Yeah. So yeah. what's the go with you and when can people catch you next? Because I know you've got one final event coming up. Is it one? Yeah, yeah I got a uh, workshop at Sue Burns Studio in Cannington, awesome. which I love going there. I go there a few times a year and teach a workshop and, yeah, she, she's a beautiful teacher. I really love the community that she's cultivated around her. Um, so I've got that. And then I'll probably do a couple of beach yoga classes, which I love as well, down at City Beach. And then we'll be back mid-December for a couple months. And, yeah, it'll be a great summer. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So you, And you're taking your book to L.A.? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. So I'll put the links below for you to um, check Stuart, Stuart's book out. It's beautiful. And um, thank you so much for spending the time to have a chat thank with you. me. It was really, really lovely. Right. And, yeah. um, and I look forward to, to catching up with you soon. Wonderful, Annie. All <laughs> the best. You, you too. Thank you. <laughs>